the ontology of terrorism. Ontologies are being used as the basis for medical surveillance of various sorts, public health surveillance. The idea behind this presentation was that there are also small ways in which ontology technology is being used in uh, criminal surveillance and in terrorism surveillance. This is a presentation of some technologies which are uh, relevant to understanding the ways ontology uh, is being used in surveillance and then I'm going to use ontology as the platform for giving a description of what kind of phenomenon terrorism is. And I, I have a general definition of terrorism I in the back of my mind, uh, which is roughly speaking, a terrorist act is an act performed by a non-military organization or person not representing any national government officially, which involves a, a very violent act which either kills innocent civilians or threatens innocent civilians for political purposes of the sort which involve persuading the governments which control the territories where those civilians live to change their policies. That's the general background I have in mind. But I'm more interested today in spe the specific case of ISIS terrorism. I think that ISIS terrorism is important today and I think it is an illustration of a general phenomenon and I'm going to use examples which are related to ISIS. As we have seen there are ontologies in the biomedical realm which are being used to make predictions. For instance uh, if you know that a given gene is present in a given sample then you know that there could be activity of a certain sort in this sample given such and such stimuli. And the three gene ontologies are the, the best example of this application. But we can apply ontologies also not just to predict behavior on the level of biochemistry or cell biology, but also on the level of human behavioral biology. So there, there are a series of ontologies which have been developed for this purpose. One of which is the mental functioning ontology, which has to do with things like cognitive processes of thinking and planning, and the mental disease ontology, which has to do with specific subkinds of processes, for instance, processes manifested in addictive behavior, for instance, gambling. And those kinds of processes go hand in hand with certain kinds of diseases. They are parts of the disease course of, for instance, gambling addiction disorder. And then we have the emotion ontology, which extends the mental functioning ontology to include not just cognitive representations, but also affective representations, such as feelings of various sorts, feeling happy, feeling that it is good, and so forth. And so the emotion ontology is going to be uh, of obvious relevance to the ontology of terrorism, um, since there are quite characteristic kinds of emotions associated with terrorism. The terrorists want to bring about certain emotions on the part of their victims and on the, on the part of the populace to which their victims belong and on the part of the governments which are in control of the territory where those populace populations live. So emotions are important to terrorism already for that reason. And so the emotion ontology distinguishes, for instance, emotion processes such as fame or shame or, sorry, fear or shame and emotion appraisals such as the appraisal that something is pleasant or that something is just or that something is surprising and then feelings such as feeling restless, feeling weak, feeling alert, feeling energetic, feeling calm, feeling strong. These are all emotional feelings which are captured in the emotion. And then that these, these emotional feelings are associated with certain kinds of physiological responses such as blushing or experiencing a lump in the throat or heart beating at a slower rate and so on. And all of this is captured in the emotion ontology. Then there are football hooligans which will play an important role in what follows. And the, the bloke who is being hit by Wayne 
appraises Wayne's behavior, uh, feels angry, has a certain kind of response, namely he wants to punch Wayne. And these are main features of the emotional ontology. All right, so the emotional ontology extends the mental functioning ontology, which extends PFO. The emotional ontology can be found here and in various other places. It was built by Jana Hastings, whose name is down here at the bottom, to a large degree. I and she was originally uh, working as one of the principal developers of the Chemical Entities of Biological Interest ontology, which is a chemistry ontology. And the, the connection is clear. In certain emotions go hand in hand with certain chemical phenomena. So this is happiness, which is an emotion which is connected with neurotransmitter receptor activity, which is realized by neurotransmitters. One example of a neurotransmitter is dopamine. Now we can take behavior ontologies like the emotion ontology and use them to predict real-world events, this is the idea anyway, in just the same sort of way that the gene ontology is used to predict chemical or biological events. So the idea is that you collect a lot of data, for instance, ta Twitter data, you tag it with ontology terms uh, from the emotion ontology, you use the, the tagged data to create sentiment profiles, either for individuals in a given block in, in Baltimore, or of groups or villages or tribes, you compare these sentiment profiles to the sentiment profiles of groups whose behaviors you already understand and then the computer uses the differences to find markers for groups which are likely to commit football hooliganism or terrorism or crime or uh, mass suicide or whatever it might be. Um, the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Did you know that there was such a journal? So high throughput biology does the same thing. You start with a biological example, tissue from somebody's lung. You shotgun sequence the sample to reveal genes which are differentially expressed from the normal lung sample. You use the go to create a functional profile of this set of genes. And then you compare this with the profiles for types of lung tissue which are already well understood. And then you use the results to predict what, whether Jim is going to get cancer or not or has cancer. And you can do the same thing with drug abuse surveillance. You have social media chatter in Baltimore mentioning white girl and you perform natural language processing to, re to reveal different areas of Baltimore engaging in this chatter. And then you use the emotion ontology to create a sentiment profile. You compare this with the profiles for typical sentiment profiles of persons living in the corresponding areas about which you know whether they are taking drugs or not taking drugs, and then you use the results to predict where the next overdose outbreaks will occur. That kind of thing. That's cool. So, and now it's being done already for terrorism. So, counter terrorism data mining using <coughs> ontology. Data mining using ontology. This is just one example. And you can use it to create sentiment profile, the emotion ontology. Uh, to create sentiment profiles also for religious texts. So this is the Quran and the Bible. Uh, both of them have a very high component of joy and anger. Um, so the, the, the most strong signals for both of them come from joy and anger. And uh, uh, they disagree on fear and trust. So basically the uh, Bible is low on fear and low on trust, where the Quran is high on fear and high on trust. I'm not sure what you can do with that. Uh, so we've had drug abuse. Now there was a huge report carried out by the US Department of Justice about domestic radicalization. So the idea is that some individuals, some adolescents primarily, are becoming radicalized. They're sometimes they're, be they're, they're being converted to Islam and becoming part of uh, terrorist groups or terrorist helper groups. And the, the, this report was designed to explore empirically 
what were the precursors of radicalization? What were the markers which would enable you to predict radicalization and, if possible, to prevent radicalization? So it's a, a very big effort. And the questions that were addressed were, what are the backgrounds uh, between different uh, groups which uh, we can use as a basis for understanding radicalization differences, so contextual, personal, ideological, experiential differences between those who commit violent acts and those who don't. Can we identify causal pathways to violent extremism? And are there causal mechanisms which are supported by empirical evidence? So that was what they were trying to find out. Now, Scott Atran is a neuroanthropologist. In 2015, he published this piece in, in which he, reflecting this, the discovery that one in four French youth between the ages of 18 and 24 are favorably disposed towards ISIS. Out of 11 ISIS sympathizers captured in Barcelona, five were recent atheist or Christian converts. Now, that's amazing data and it shows how difficult it is to predict radicalization or predict those people who are going to become violent extremists. So let's take this example uh, again just as a, a test case. So Michael Zdehaf Bibo was the shooter of unarmed soldiers in Ottawa in 2004. He described himself as an ISIS follower. He had a history of mental illness, and drug addiction and petty criminality. And it turns out that they were the markers for radicalization, which were the only significant markers discovered in this big EADR research report. So of all the warning indicators that were considered, that were considered only participation in pre-radicalization criminal activities gave you empirically useful evidence of likelihood of radicalization. And then another marker was post-radicalization clique membership, but then that's already post-radicalization, so you're, uh, you're too late. So another marker is a history of mental health problems. They looked at economic deprivation, low educational attainment, and they did not give any kind of signal. Petty criminality, clique membership, and history of mental health problems were the ones which gave the signal. So now I'm going to move to another area. If petty criminality is important, then the most important data for predicting radicalization is going to be police data. And there are now many very commonly used and very uh, ambitious IT systems used by police to capture criminals. So one of them is called CopLink. And this was used as the basis for a terrorist group detection approach documented in this paper here in a volume entitled Mathematical Metal Methods in Counterterrorism. And Coplink it does what you can see. So it collects data about uh, particular individuals and it puts the data together in a large database and allows you to reason over the data in the ways that one does. And TMODS is an ontology which uses some of the same descriptive terms as Coplink, but which focuses on descriptive terms relevant to terrorist acts. And in this particular era, renting trucks, observing factories, and so forth, buying fertilizer, were all viewed as being activities indicative of potential involvement in violent terrorism. So they linked the Coplick data to the TMODS ontology. Given the, this high correlation between participating in terrorist acts and, and participating in criminal acts, and given that Coplink is capturing huge amounts of data about just those criminal acts, so if you can spot the criminal acts which have some connection to terrorism, then you may be able to do something useful. Moreover, it's been shown that the really important terrorists very often collaborate with criminals to get resources because they have shared tactics to get money, uh, to move money. And so linking to the police database may give you 
information also on that side. So we have the threatening activity pattern and we have the coupling data and we use the threatening activity pattern to mine through the coupling data in order to identify persons who might be either targets for terrorist recruitment or actually already involved in terrorist acts. I'll give you just one example. Um, so they have uh, the term harbor and they have a specific harbor in mind. They have a certain person and again they have a specific person in mind who works in the harbor and then they have a suspicious individual. And the suspicious individual is defined as an individual without valid ID. And uh, this person has a criminal record, uh, his offense was financial fraud, and so you can see how you're collecting connections between persons. One person hired another, they both work at the harbor. One has a criminal record. So a compromised individual is an individual who is connected to a suspicious individual. So you create these graphs connecting people to other people. And, and the graphs include ontology terms, connecting those people to terrorist, act terrorist activity or to activities connected to terrorist activity in some cases. And then you do statistical uh, pattern recognition in order to find the most likely potential targets of radicalization. And uh, this is, this is uh, Colonel Bill Mandrick. This uh, slide was created by Colonel Mandrick. And I'm going to use this slide as the basis for developing an ontology of what I think terrorism is. You can see what is going on here. We have a Salafist website stand with a prophet. And this Belgian male subscribes to this website. And um, th he participates in a demonstration. Uh, the Salafist social network coordinates this demonstration. He's a member of this social network and he's a member of the congregation which works through the Grand Mosque of Belgium. And he adheres to a jihadist ideology which is promulgated by this Salafist website. So this is not, th this is not the way I would build a picture like this, but I'll build pictures which correspond to my way of thinking uh, in a minute. So my way of thinking would distinguish the types from the instances. And here, everything which is represented is an instance, and then the relations are all relations between instances. Uh, but that's not important because here, the, the instance information and the relation information is already enough to tell you many of the things that you want to know. So this is how I would do it. So I would have the Belgian male as a person, which is an object, the Grand Mosque of Belgium is a mosque, which is an object, the Stand with the Prophet website is a website, and um, the Kaleidoscope of Global Jihad is a, an instance of transnational network of networks, and Stand with the Prophet social network is an instance of Salasis social network, the congregation is an instance of congregation, and so on. So the ontology is everything above the solid horizontal line, and everything below is instances. So we'll keep that um, and we'll just bear this demonstration on the 14th of May 2014 in mind and we'll look at the grooming recruitment drill box. So our 19 year old Belgian male was radicalized through grooming recruitment and drill. And you remember drill from the military doctrine. So we're talking about the same kind of neuropsychological change in a human being through drill. And but drill presupposes recruitment and gr recruitment presupposes grooming and I'm just going to assume that you all know what those things are. They are all subtypes of process in the BFO sense. The agent of this grooming, recruitment and drill was some subset of the members of the congregation of the Grand Mosque of Belgium. And the outcome of the um, grooming, recruitment and drill is a belief in the ideology and the, the skill as a jihad fighter which comes from 
the grooving improvement in drill. So the martial skill comes from the drill. Uh, the religious belief comes from the drill. And he has now a skill as a jihad fighter and a belief in the standard of the prophet ideology. This is an instance of religious belief and this is an instance of martial skill. And they are produced. They are the outputs of those processes. And then the martial skill and the belief are realized in a terrorist act which took place on the 14th of May 2019. The picture we have so far is quite coherent. So in many typical cases of radicalized males, all of those things did happen. I said that a terrorist act is an act which is intended to communicate something. It's a, a speech act kind of phenomenon, but it has a, a huge chunk of violence or a threat of violence attached to it. Uh, so terrorists engage in behavior that is a mixture of language and violence. It's not a speech act, it's a speech act plus. So in order to understand terrorism, we have to understand language. Uh, that we do not have an ontology of language which is mature in the way that the gene ontology is mature. So what I'm going to be presenting now is what I think will serve as part of the ontology of language as time goes by. So I'm going to define a language in terms of the competences of its users. So the English language is the totality of competences of all the speakers of English, both native speakers of English and people who learn English. And it changes over time, because the English language changes over time. And it's different in different areas, because different people have dialects. So a dialect is a part of a language. It's a sub-aggregate of the total aggregate of competences. And competence is a skill, or it's an expertise, it's an ability, which is realized in a performance of speaking or writing or understanding. I was born in Manchester, which is here. And we have very specific dialects in Manchester, just as everywhere in England has very specific dialects. And this is a kind of map of families of dialects. So th we're talking about the English language now specifically, which is an instance of language, which is a subtype of aggregate of dispositions, which is a subtype of disposition in BFF. A dialect is a part of a language, which is a subtype. It's a subtype of an aggregate of dispositions, but it's not itself a language. And the rules for saying when a sufficiently large aggregate of dialects is a language have to do with geography, with geopolitics, and with military support. So Manchester dialect is a sub-language, a dialect of the English language. People who speak a given dialect very often behave in similar ways. So there are behavioral patterns which go hand in hand with linguistic patterns. And this is Manchester. So I come from around here. Um, so in, in the heart of the city, we have uh, people who would really like to be living in London. And then over here, we have rough, poor people. Down here, we have people who are quite happy to be living in the south of Manchester because it's leafy and, and, and there are nice restaurants. So now, we see that the dialect behavior patterns go hand in hand also with divisions between the rich and the poor, basically. Or the educated and the uneducated. Uh, so these are all dialects. There's the broad Manchester, poor Manchester, rough Manchester, and posh Manchester, roughly. Rough speech goes hand in hand with rough behavior, that's my point. And dialects of speech in general go hand in hand with what we can think of as dialects of behavior. And these are, well, these are from Liverpool. All right, so we have linguistic dispositions and we have behavioral dispositions. And this whole dialect behavior aggregate is what terrorism is going to be. So football hooligans in the good old days had their own football hooligan speech patterns and their own football hooligan behavior patterns, which were realized in, for instance, acts of thumping Liverpool fans. So this is a process realizing a disposition, thumping a Liverpool fan, which is realized from a specific group of individuals who form both a linguistic and a behavioral community. Now this makes the thumping of the Liverpool fan different from just any old criminal act. If Jim is a criminal, then Jim has a disposition to criminal violence, let's suppose. That's 
a behavioral discipline on the part of Jim. And he may go around mugging random pedestrians in order to steal their wallets. But he's not trying to send a message. He's not, this is not a linguistic act. This is just criminal behavior. Football hooliganism is not just criminal behavior. It's a certain kind of linguistically or message sending uh, involving behavior, just like terrorism. All right, so there is the sacred language of jihad. There are dispositions to acts of holy war. And this pattern, this dialect behavior aggregate, is realized in the shooting of unarmed soldiers in Ottawa. So this is what I mean when I say terrorism is a speech act which is fused with violence. You're sending a message through violence. Scott Atran and various other people have written about the phenomenon of what they call deterritorialization. De so if you are part of an army and you are trained through all the drills and, and, and trust, loyalty, esprit de corps, generating mechanisms I referred to earlier, then you're drilled with a love of country. You're doing what you're doing as a member of the military because you are a member of the military of the United States or uh, Russia or China or wherever it might be. But terrorists are not doing what they're doing because they are a citizen of a certain country or because they live in a certain territory. What they're doing is a, at a much higher level. In the olden days, where there were no documents, no internet, no um, radios, no TV, no cinema, people engaged in phenomena which were restricted to speech acts, face-to-face -face interactions in between small groups within a single village or a single community. The theory of speech acts developed by Reed and so forth focused on small miniature societies like that, small villages or the, the, um, the faculty club. And nowadays, and this is another area where I think Searle is right, but he doesn't go far enough. Nowadays, many uses of language don't involve any kind of intimate interaction between individuals in s miniature societies. They involve the whole world. In the olden days, war was, res was territorially restricted. Germany would go to war against France. In the early jihad days, the Crusades and so forth, holy war was a territorially rooted war. So the Christians wanted to save Jerusalem and the Muslims wanted to take Jerusalem back for a Muslim cause. But since, roughly speaking, bin Laden, although you may say this goes back a lot earlier, the military process of jihad has become abstracted from any given territory. This is a new step in terrorism generally, so the IRA and the Shining Path and Black September are all tied to specific governments and specific territory. But ISIS is directed towards all human beings and to God. When you're performing an act of terrorism, on behalf of ISIS, it's God, as well as the whole globe, which is your addressee. You're not trying to persuade any given government to change its behavior. You're trying to prove something to everybody. This is the thesis of deterritorialization. Scott Atran talks about the global jihadi archipelago. And he says that the, what we're dealing with, with ra radicalization of terrorists, is Peer communities of imagined kin, bands of brothers and sisters drawn from across more than a hundred countries and ethnic groups who commit in ritual oaths and performance of sublime acts of terror to a new world order. He explicitly compares these bands of brothers to football hooligans. Football hooligans commit to beating up Liverpool fans. 